can you name the things? Now, one of the things you should be able to do is to look at these pictures. I guess number of one to six. And uh, we'll talk about it with your neighbors and, you know, just kind of like correctly name what each of those depicts. Do it right now on your half sheet, one through six. What's your next lecture exam? Monday. You're going to have to do this. So if that perks your ears up a little bit, <laughs> I'll go through it with you, but I'm just trying to like warm you up from what we talked about last time. And in terms of difficulty, I categorize this as easy. So um, try to wake the brain up here.
All right. Um, number one, um, let's inflow. Systole, also called late diastole. Uh, three. Now that's systole. Now systole has two parts. That's the part with isovolumetric ventricular contraction. The first part is systole. is to leave outflow ventricular rejection. <coughs> number five, it's isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. Now, if you're just writing down answers and you don't know what you're doing, you're going to be lost today and tomorrow. Tomorrow's your quiz, right? Yeah, you're going to be gagging if you didn't study. If that wasn't easy for you, man, you got a lot of work to do today. Didn't I cover this? Now, the tendency is students will just study for the next thing, which was this morning's quiz. And that's all you did. You're kind of behind the eight ball here. I mean, you saw the other quizzes tomorrow. You saw this was covered. You should have started studying this. And so, you know, just kind of taking the temperature here. If that was easy, if that was hard. If you, we, I went through this whole thing, and I'll do it again today. If, you, if you're starting to get this, it's starting to make sense to you, you you're, you're in a good place. If you didn't look at this at all, if you have no idea what that is, man, these next couple days are going to be tough for you. Summer school is like that. I cover a lot of material in one day. My expectation is, if I taught it, you know it. Okay, don't don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait for the quiz. As soon as the words come out of my mouth, the expectation is students are spending time looking at this. And if you don't do it, well, you'll see the result. For example, I just went through that. Could you do this? Yes. I won't have you do it on your half sheet, but let's just go through it together as a class. Same kind of skill set, I think. Let me find that point here. Number one, looks like, oh, the AV valves are open there. Looks like you got some inflow. I'll call this inflow or ventricular diastole. Looks like, what do they show me here? I'm full. My EDV is about 120. What's EDV? End diastolic volume. Looks like I'm in a state of systole. All the valves are closed. Blood isn't coming in or going out. This is isovolumetric contraction. Mm -hmm. This one, oh, look, this is the main job of the heart, ventricular ejection or outflow. They're showing me the SL valve is open. Here it's looking like the pressure in the ventricles is dropping. Blood starts to flow backwards, but it closes and sits on top of the SL valve. So that's isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. Mm -hmm. So these pictures are very useful. They, they give you a single shot, and the expectation is the student, oh yeah, I, you can kind of figure out where you are in the cardiac cycle. So when I taught the Wigger's diagram, what I just drew on the board, this is, I would say, 
one of the figures, those, if there's one figure I could choose that you need to master for the next test, this is it. Everything is here. We have left particular volume. We have pressures of different things, the aorta, the ventricle, and the atrium on the left heart. Um, we have the heart sounds, the left duct. I didn't mention that. I didn't do ECG yet, that's today's lecture, as well as the cardiac action potential. But it's all here in the different phases. So for example, you need to make sense of this information on this graph. Number one, ventricular filling, mid-diastole. Where is that? Well, we started off talking about it right here. This is mid to late diastole here, right in here. Looks like pressure's dropping there. So you kind of kind of have to know where you are. Okay, number two, atrial systole. Where is that on the graph? That little blip right there. Number three, isovolumetric, ventricular contraction. See this little section right there? The pressure is rising, that's it there. And then the ejection is right here. This is isovolumetric relaxation, this bar. Okay. And this is the start of inflow for the next one. You start feeling the heart for the next heartbeat. So everything's there. And um, how I use this for the test is, well, I give students a blank one to study, like this one. And um, here's the, the whole thing. This has the pictures, and they correspond with that. Okay. And um, yeah, I think it's useful to look at. There's other ways we can study the cardiac cycle. This is just, well, you tell me, is this the left heart or the right heart? They show both hearts. But this is data for which one? The left. And that's what usually the one we like to focus on. However, don't forget about the right heart. It has the same cardiac cycle. So that's why I included these next couple of slides. So that students can see the right heart and left heart side by side. And we can see it's relatively the same looking thing. It's exactly the same down here. But there is a difference here. Which heart generates more pressure? The left does. Now the right heart doesn't have to generate as much, it's pumping against less resistance. Because the lungs are filled with air, which provide less resistance to push against. Usually the capillary beds on the systemic circuit are fluid filled, and it generates much more pressure. Now the thing that um, I to emphasize is right here, the right versus the left. Note that absolute pressure generated by the RV is less, but the stroke volume ejected is equal to the uh, left. So even though, yeah, so even though the um, pressure is less, it generates equal output. So we'll get this as that. Mm. So LV pressure, the peak pressure, if you read the graph, is about 120 millimeters of mercury. That's about the textbook average. Here I think it says 110. Yeah, that's about 110, 120, 130. The RV pressure, it only generates going to be a peak pressure of about maybe 30 millimeters of mercury. And without looking at this data, if that's all you know, you might say, oh, well, if I said, well, which will eject more? You kind of phrase it in a way that's a trick. Which ejects more? Neither. I mean, this is the same. It's a trick question, right? You would think, oh, generate more pressure, it would reject more blood. That's not the case. Output is equal. other. The right heart is pumping blood to the lungs, but then where does that blood go? Back to the left heart. The left heart is pumping blood to the whole body, but where does that end up? It goes back to the right heart, so they have to keep up with each other. If not, things are going to get backed up. Let's pretend you have a heart attack on the left heart, and it can't keep up. So it can't push blood forward, so it's like blood is trying to return to it from the lungs, but left heart is weak from a heart attack, what happens? 
You get, you get, yeah, so I mean, you can, the fluid gets backed up with fluid. They call it congestive heart failure. What's congesting in the lungs? They become filled with fluid because it's like you can't return. Or what's, what if the reverse is true? What if the right heart had a heart attack and it can't keep up? Well, let's see, blood is trying to return to it from the veins, but it can't. So it's like you see all these neck veins bulging and because it can't return. So it's like, it's important that they keep up with each other. Okay. That's a very important clinical point that students should realize. Pressure is different, but the output is equal. Now there's another way we can study the cardiac cycle, yet another way. Let's go back to the left heart and talk about these pressure volume curves. Same data as over there, except now instead of plotting there's time, 0.8 seconds. Instead of plotting pressure against time, volume against time, we plot um, pressure against volume. That's different. But it's the same data. And this is another way uh, to present the cardiac cycle. And I put this up there so I can color code it this to that. Because I want you to see how it's like the same kind of data set. Call this a pressure volume. And let's write our key numbers. If we're plotting volume milliliters on the x-axis, let's go 5120. If we're going pressure on the x-axis, yeah, they, they go all the way up to, let me just put my numbers here. Uh, uh, 10, so they go up to 100. Uh, they go up to about 130. I only went up to like 120, so let me just go up to 120. Well, anyways, that's pressure. So how they show it is they put these points, and let's start with point A. Now, for us, our point A on, over here is going to be when you start, if you look, look where the volume is. In terms of volume, what number is that? 50. Where do we start to fill at 50 over here? Let me show you. That's a, that's a zero. Here's 50. Right there. This point is where we start to fill this orange. So this is the beginning of inflow. Where we go from 50 to 120. So I'm going to use orange because I use orange for inflow. So this orange is going to be, and I'm just going to go like this. I'm going to draw a point that's orange from A. Well, they go B, C, and I don't know. It's drawn up right here. So they put a point B. I'll, I'll go ahead and do that, but I don't teach point B. So let's say this is from point A to C. What I would say for points A to C is that segment is inflow for this data. A to C, that line segment, inflow, or, or mm -hmm. diastole, or whatever else we call it, right? Ventricular filling, all that stuff that we call it. And it's easy to see because you start at 50, and you increase to 120. And the pressure remains low the entire time because the heart muscles relax. You're just filling with blood. That's all that is. Well, then from C, the pressure increases. From C to D, it goes from like 10 to like 80. Now, for mine, <clears throat> that's right here, the green line, where pressure starts to increase from 10 to about 80. I'll, I'll use green, so I'll yeah, just put this over here. So let me put another tick right here. So 
goes straight up. So that green line matches this green line. I, I try to color code it and say, now, let me ask you a question. From this segment from C to D, is there a volume change? Yes or no? No. 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 The no's are correct. At C, what's the volume? 120. At D, what's the volume? 120. So we call that isovolumetric contraction, right? So from um, C to D, isovolumetric ventricular contraction. Then you rise to meet the arterial pressure. So let's remember that this black line over here is the pressure of the aorta. Okay. Now, as you start to push blood into, this, um, into the aorta, we see a pressure rise and the pressure drop. So that's kind of like it's going to rise up and then it's going to start to fall right around. Something like that. So we call this um, the peak pressure is point E. This point here. And then when it starts to drop to this point, call that point F. Well, anyways, this is all outflow. So from D to F is outflow. lecture, I also refer to it as ventricular ejection. Ventricular ejection. From D to F. And, you know, let's, let's look at it on the Wicker's diagram. You can see the pressure rise and the pressure drop. You can see that the volume, you're pushing all the blood out. So, for us, volume decreased from 120 to 50. And um, yeah, that's the case here. You, you start off at D at 120, but you go in reverse down to 50. So that's a stroke volume of like 70. Okay. Right, but anyways, to finish it off, from F back to A, the pressure drops and there's no volume change. Now, for, for us over here, I use blue symbolize the pressure drop and there's no change in pressure. So I'll use blue again. From F back to A. So as you go from F back to A, name it isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. Three long words. Isovolumetric The volume's not changing, the volume's 50. Blood's not coming in, blood's not going out. All the valves are closed. Isovolumetric, ventricular. Relaxation. How do you know the muscle's relaxing? Well, what's happening to the pressure? It, it drops. In fact, it drops so much, it drops below that of our atrial pressure, and it starts to fill again. Okay, so you, that's why it's called a, a PV loop, because it loops back to point A. And you just start filling in, you just keep going around and around and around. So hopefully it's starting to click. I do, I do present cardiac cycle in both ways uh, on the exam. So are, are there any questions that I have on the live segments? Okay, maybe it's starting to click. Let me ask you this. In lecture, I presented where valves open and close. For example, um, last time I pointed right here, I, I remember, and I put, oh, that's where the bicuspid valve um, closes. It, it closes right there. The bicuspid valve closes. That open closing, and it's, it's confusing even to me from time to time. Um, so I want you to know kind of like where this is over there. And it's right here. In both places, right here, when you start to generate systole, 
you close the bicuspid valve so blood doesn't regurgitate backwards to the atrium. So, bicuspid valve closes. At point C for this for the PV loop. Now, we said that makes a heart sound. Is it the love or the, or the dump? No, no, no. It's the first heart sound, the love. Very good. I also pointed to right here for the aortic SL valve opens. Right around there. That's the point at where you push open, you've risen to meet aortic pressure, and you can start to push blood into the artery, the aorta. So that red star is where aortic SL valve opens, and for us, it's point D. That point D. I'll put a red star. Aortic SL valve opens. You push out all the blood. I mean, you had, um, you pushed it all up to this point. And this next point. Right around there, I'll put this blue star. That's when you get the dichrotic notch because pressure is dropping. Blood actually starts to flow backwards into the ventricle, but the aortic SL valve closes and makes the dump set. So this point over here, yeah, very good, yeah. Aortic SL valve closes. That's the dump, D U P. And then pressure drops and drops and drops until you get below atrial pressure. Right here, the lecture I said, I use the orange star. That's where the bicuspid valve opens and you fill again. So for us, then we go back to point A here. Right here. So, my custard opens, you start to fill again at point A. So it all matches. It's another way to study the cardiac cycle, and it's a little easier to look at. You could also calculate stroke volume, too. I could ask you, What's the EDV? What's the end diastolic volume? And you could look at it and give me exact number. It's one point. What's the end systolic volume? Oh, it's 50. And what's stroke volume? Well, it's 70. You should be able to calculate that relatively easily since the numbers are given. Okay. Uh, this has an animation. Too long. Let's see. Oh, hey, it works. Let me show it to you over here. Hold on. the best uh, animation I've seen of the uh, cardiac cycle. And what you can do is hit the play button. And they show you the heart, how the chambers contract at the same time, they show you right heart and left heart. What I like is how they phase through the Wigger's diagram over here. And they even phase through the heart sounds and the ECG, which we'll cover today. But what you could do is you could freeze frame it and go back and forth. So you can stop it. And you want to stop it right there. And you can see where the line is. You can go forward a little bit, frame by frame, and you can go backwards. And this might give you a good visual uh, if, you're trying, if you're kind of confused about what's going on and when. Okay. By the way, is that link is in the PowerPoint slides. Okay, let me open that up.
So here are the kinds of things I um, like to ask for the written part of the next exam, which are day of three. I'll just kind of point to stuff on this diagram, and I'll ask you if you can name it. Like, I would say one of the more difficult things I have you do is this one here for the exam, where I'll like kind of point to something, and I'll mix up the pictures, and I'll make you match it. Why don't you try this one right now? Uh, call it number two and label it one to five and put it at a different part for the one through six part we did earlier. You do this on your half sheet. See how you do. If you flub it up now, it's okay, but I want to get you thinking about how do I do this by doing this on your half sheet now. So, I'm going to erase this. Each exam has their has the, the telltale thing where it's like I grade it, and if the student nails it, they probably ace the whole exam. This is that for this exam. If you nail this, your your grade is probably going to be an A for the whole test. This is a big part of your understanding. So don't brush this one aside. Is what I'm saying. Don't just wait for me to tell you the answer and then forget about it. Try to understand this one. All right, in the interest of time, let me uh, <laughs> doing here. Uh, that picture is isovolumetric relaxation. This number one shows it because it's bracketing this dark bar here. So this first one's number one. The next one, um, 
That's like the first part of inflow, early diastole. You're starting to do that here for number three. This one is isovolumetric contraction, ventricular contraction, the first part of systole. And that is shown by number four, where the pressure is rising right there. This one is ventricular ejection. Now that's shown by number five because I put the bracket here at 130 and then you empty the heart down to 70. Well, that one is number five. This one is ventricular, um, no, it's basically atrial uh, systole. Number two is pointing at that one. Now what I love about this is I can ask it any way I want. This is not the only way I can ask about these phases. For example, for this one, I said, oh, okay, well, they should know that this part is outflow. I could have put it, like, here. That's also, you know, outflow. I mean, there's, there's different ways I could have put it. So that's why your understanding of this is more important. So if you're like, uh, oh, okay, I think I see what you're doing, and you're probably in a good place, um, You've got to know uh, this chart. It's pretty much the bread and butter of physiology here. And if you want to know what else you could do to study is, um, I'm not going to have you do these on your half sheets. Let's kind of do them together. The other things I like to ask. Consider one to four over here. Which valve? opens or closes at one, two, three, four. And we just kind of went through this. My cuspid valve closes, aortic SL valve opens, and aortic SL valve closes, my cuspid opens. So it's pretty easy. My cuspid closes, then opens, aortic SL valve opens and closes, okay? And if you kind of repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, it becomes second nature at some point. What about those heart sounds, the lug? Let's remember that the heart sounds are when the valves close. That first heart sound would occur right around here. Okay. That's supposed to represent heart sound. Um, and then where does it close the duct? Uh, that's not the heart sound for that. Wait, wait, it closes right there at number three. Okay. And then, then I say estimate diastolic, systolic blood pressure. Well, you got to look at the aortic curve for that. It peaks out at, at close to 120, and the lowest point it gets is about 80. Okay which is a typical textbook blood pressure. So that can also be estimated from looking at that graph. And the other thing that we went through this morning was the line segments. And so we already did that, okay? So you can just kind of look at that on your own. And in addition to the segments, know, again, the points at which the valves of the left part open and close. So if you can master um, these kinds of questions, this to this to this to this to this, you're in good shape for the written part of the next exam. Students always ask me that, right? So, now you know. So now you don't have to ask me, right? Some, someone will, but most of you, I think, just heard that. Yeah, question? Did you say that love is when it closes and dove is when it opens? Oh, no, the both when they close. Okay. The love is when the bicuspid valve closes. The duct is when the aortic SL valve closes. Oh. So let's transition out of uh, cardiac cycle to ECG. That's tomorrow's lab, so I'm going to start that right now. <coughs> if you had your coloring, um, there's one page on the coloring that I passed out the last time that's I want to use a little bit to show you where those uh, nodes are.
today we have our first heart dissection, and tomorrow we have our first physiology lab, uh, the ECG. The ECG stands for electrocardiogram, so here. And it's basically a compound action potential. It's a composite of all the ash potentials generated by autorhythmic and contractile cells. It's not sometimes as assumed because you just came from 430 where we teach the ash potential. The ash potential is of a single cell, but this is of the entire cardiac heart. So it's basically a composite of all the ash potentials put together, and they call that the ECG. So here's a picture of how the signal spreads throughout the heart. But I, I really just want to define how the signal is generated and the kind of cells we're doing. Less than 1% of the heart are, are called these autorhythmic cells. They have an intrinsic conduction system. With each heartbeat, the signal spreads through the whole heart. So any group of autorhythmic cells that can self-generate action potentials, they say that those cells have a pacemaker potential. They generate your pulse. Right? They, they generate the heart rate. ECG, you see it, but it's generated. Autorhythmic cells. Which have pacemaker potential. Think of it this way. These are cells that can self-generate action potentials. abbreviated ash potentials AP in this lecture. This is of extreme importance, for example. If you have a pacemaker that can generate one ash potential, think of it this way, one AP, that will spread through the entire heart and generate one cardiac cycle. or one heartbeat, okay? So that, that's the importance of it. And depending on the rate at which you generate the ash potentials, that determines your heart rate. And so typically we say, textbook standard, if you have a heart rate of 75 BPM, well, what's the pacemaker rate? 75. <laughs> so it, it generates the heart, the, we call it the normal sinus rhythm, your regular heart rate. Normal sinus rhythm. Speed up, slow down, they call that tachycardia, speed up, bradycardia, slow down, but normal sinus rhythm, boom, it's generated by these special cells. So that's what I teach you what, the, what these cells are. Um, these cells that have pacemaker potential First off, for ECG, how, how we visualize it. What we're going to be doing in tomorrow's lab is, um, well, we have these electrodes that you could put on the skin. And I think it's remarkable that you could put them on the skin and they could pick up the electrical activity of the heart. It's much like if instead of an electrode, you had a camera for a view of the heart. If you put the camera at a different location, you get a different perspective of the heart. I mean, just like if you had a picture of a car. If you put the camera here, you get the front end. If you put a camera back here, you get a back end of the same car, but it's just a different view of the car. 
I mean, it's the exact same thing for these electrodes that we use that we place on the body. If you're to ever do, to do a 12 lead, I mean, you would learn that. You're not going to do that in this class. We're, we're just going to do like one lead, not 12. A 12 lead would be like 12 views of the heart. And that's the standard clinical thing that you, you might see later on in your career. Uh, so, for example, this young boy is getting a 12, 12 lead. And it would generate 12 different views of the heart, of the electrical activity. And to the trained eye, to the cardiologist, um, you, you know what you're seeing there, and you know what to look for if something's wrong. So I just want you to get the concept. We're not doing a 12 lead. We're only doing one of those 12. It, it's lead two. That's the one lead we're doing. And what is a lead? A lead is a view of the heart. There's 12. Six are in the frontal plate. Okay. So what you see here is you could put electrodes on ankle, on wrist, and you get a view of the electrical activity of the heart, which kind of blows me away. It's like, oh, you know, you put it way out there, and you can tell what's going on in the, yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Well, anyways, we're doing lead two, which is this one, from there to there, okay? Um, these, the chest leads, will give you a transverse view of the heart. Okay, these leads down here are transverse view. But we're just doing this one in the frontal plane for tomorrow's. Lab. So what a lead is, we're doing lead two, a lead is a positive electrode to the left leg, negative electrode to the right arm. So tomorrow's lab, we're going to have this set up, where you just have two leads, negative to positive, the black is a gram. Okay. That's all it is. So when you see this one view right there, it's lead number two. Okay. So what that lead is doing is, I mean, you got 12 leads, so for our one lead, it's approximating this axis right there. That's lead to, you know, just imagine the hearts there. That's basically your lead, and um, it, it's pretty straightforward what a lead is. When the wave of depolarization, okay, that's the action potential. When the wave of depolarization moves toward the positive lead, there's a positive deflection in the ECG recording. So let's say, for example, there's, you, you got a flat one. Hopefully it doesn't stay flat, but basically they call that the isoelectric line, your, your baseline. If you see a deflection, what it means is, um, well, basically, the depolarization is traveling in the same direction as your lead. That's all it means when you see these deflections. So typically it looks like this. They put these letters P, Q, R, S, T. That's a typical ECG trace. Okay. So, Isoelectric line doesn't mean there's nothing happening. It just means the depolarization is traveling perpendicular to your lead. Whatever lead, in this case lead two. So if you see any kind of deflection up or down, it simply means that the polarization is more or less traveling in the same direction as your lead. Any deflection. Means the polarization, dipole, is traveling in the same direction as your lead. For us, there'll be one lead. Lead two.
So then it's very important to understand these ECG, ECG components, and it's the student's job to understand which part of the ECG corresponds to which part of the cardiac cycle. So this is why I teach the cardiac cycle first. You know, when I did um, one year, students were taking a test, and I was just kind of messing with it. And I just took my ECG, and it came out a little messy. And I was like, you know what, this is a good example to show students. Because when you do the lab, you don't always get the prettiest one that the textbook shows. So it's, it's a good one for you to learn from. So what I did was I just highlighted all of my ECG components, and I'll, I'll, I'll use them in this presentation here. So let's learn how the signal spreads through the heart. So um, I want to color on that one. This page here. As we'll see, it starts right there. You tell me what chamber of the heart is this one? Right atrium. Right atrium. Very good. Very good. It starts right there. The best pacemaker, we call it the number one pacemaker, it's the strongest one, it's the sinal atrial node, or SA node, we call it in the end here. Right there. That is the SA node in the right atrium. You know, it's funny, I always show my ECG to the class and I feel like, like I'm sharing my intimate details with you. It's just my ECG. Well, if you're the subject in your group tomorrow, you know, it's just your ECGs. That's all it is. Well, anyways, that SA note, what I call it red, I almost never call it its full name, sinal atrial node. I always just call it the SA node. It's the number one pacemaker. And in the heart, there are three groups of cells that have this pacemaker potential. The one that's the strongest will, will command the heart rate and determine the normal sinus rhythm. And for, you know, in the absence of pathology, it's going to be this one. This one establishes normal sinus rhythm. this group of cells fire action potentials like at their own rate, it, it could fire 80 to 100 per minute on its own. There's always some parasympathetic activity that kind of dampens it. But if you just let these guys go, in the absence of parasympathetic activity, they could do 80 to 100. Okay. Now, um, this is, um, I have the P wave there. It represents atrial depolarization. Now, the signal has to spread through the whole heart. What I like about these little pictures from the book, the yellow represents depolarization. And as it spreads through all the atria, the RA and the LA, it's using these things called internodal pathways. Let me call them in here. Um, these arrows that they got. They, they're just trying to show the student that the signal is spreading through both atria, the right and the left. arrows, internodal pathways. They don't have pacemaker potential. They're just ways for the signal to spread out from the SA node. I'll say D-pole spreads. Right atrium, left atrium. 
So the, the polarization spreads through atria in um, They're called internodal pathways, if I can ever spell it right. Internodal pathways. It's not the thing as the arrows I colored in in that pinkish color. Internodal pathways. And once it's once the depolarization spreads all the way through both atria, you see the P wave on the ECG. So, isoelectric line, how about I just use red for the P wave? Right there, and I'll zoom and draw the rest of it. And you can measure that. I highlighted it in blue on mine, and the normal range, 0.06 to 0.11. So when you measure it, the computer automatically calculates the uh, time for you. And you should really appreciate that. In the old days, when I had to do the chart paper, and I had to like count the little circle, the little square. I guess that's still done, but the user computer does it for you. Anyways, know that as the P wave. So we're talking atrial depolarization. That's what this represents. Atrial depole. Now it's not atrial systole, but it causes atrial systole. So this is immediately before atrial systole. And if you recall, during our cardiac cycle, atrial systole was like the last of the ventricular filling. So this is occurring during late diastole, okay, in the cardiac cycle. And we're going to make these connections. So P wave associate that with late diastole. So what I did to remind students that this is pertinent to the uh, ECG, after each component, what I did was I, um, I put a red box where they, where they put the P wave at the top. And I, I put it all the way down so you can kind of see where it is. We're like really at the end of diastole here, right? So it's, um, they line it all up for you there. I just wanted you to be aware of how you can study that on your own. All right, so, um, okay, so this one, let me pull this up and down, it's that black bar. So now the signal has spread through all of the atria, okay? And the goal is to push all the blood down to the ventricles. Now the heart has a problem. It's got these four chambers. The two atria contract together and the two ventricles contract together. But you never want all four chambers to contract at the same time. That'll be a train wreck. So you want there to be a delay between the time the atria contract versus the ventricles to contract. Okay, now that delay is by design. And we observe that delay in the ECG right here. So what they illustrate is all the yellow has spread through the atria, and it, it has not spread to the uh, ventricles yet. And we measure that delay um, as about 100 milliseconds. We call that a conduction delay of about 100 milliseconds. So the signal has spread to the next node. That right there is called the AV node. So let me color it in on my picture here. There's a conduction delay observed at the AV node. A conduction delay of about 100 milliseconds observed at 
AV nodes. It's basically at the border between atria and ventricles. Basically, it's stuck there. It's kind of like when freeways merge and then traffic backs up and you slow down. That, that kind of a delay is usually the analogy that's given. So I call it the AV node, that balloon color. So this delay um, allows the ventricles to finish filling. There's a delay from getting down to the ventricles. It's time between inflow and isovolumetric contractions. Let me tell you how we measure the ECG. It's measured as the PR segment of the PR interval. So let me draw both of those. Um, let's see here. Right, PR. If you're going to measure the PR interval, what you do is you start at the beginning of the P wave and you measure all the way to the Q wave. Right there, you measure all of that. seconds. That's kind of the, the normal interval, the normal delay. If it's longer than that, we say there may be some kind of a heart block. Okay. Um, PR interval. Well, the other way you could do it is to measure the PR segment. Because both are uh, measures of the delay. So let me... Um, the segment is just a shorter part of it. So the second one I drew is PR segment. Now we teach both of them. However, in practicality, the PR interval is easier to measure because it's easy for students to see the P wave and go up to Q. Sometimes you can't even see the PR segment. It's there, and that's the true mark of the delay because you don't include the, the atrial um, systole, the atrial depolarization there. But um, both represent this conduction delay. And um, it's the interval that's kind of the standard to see if there's any kind of a heart block from the signal getting from the atria all the way down to the ventricle. So this pathway serves as a bottleneck between the AV connection. This 100 uh, millisecond conduction delay gives time for the atria to contract, and you're synchronizing activation of atria and ventricles. So basically, first the atria contract, delay, then the ventricles contract. That's what you want. for the Wigner's diagram, we're not in the systole yet. There it is right there. This is the first part of systole, so this is like at the, this is like late, late diastole. We haven't even begun outflow yet. Um, so if you measure the PR interval and you see that it's longer or you see something else that's irregular on the ECG, um, we want students to know the idea of what is meant by heart block. What's blocked? The signal is blocked from atria to ventricles. And there's degrees of it, and I'll teach the basic ones. We want there to be a delay 
But if something is completely blocking the signal altogether, that's called heart block. Heart block is the conduction is somehow blocked from spreading to the ventricles. Because what we just learned, the signal starts in the atria and it's got to get down to the ventricles. So first degree heart block is defined as the arriva having this line. Um, it's slow conduction. The ECG basically shows a long PR interval greater than 0.2 seconds. Slow conduction. Basically, PR interval was greater than 0.2 seconds. That's the textbook definition. Second degree heart block, what you have there, you have a partial or intermittent block. The PR interval gets longer and longer than the AV node fails altogether. So if you look at the ECG here, second, it's like maybe it's longer and longer than you skip an R wave. Okay. You just skip a heartbeat right there. It just failed intermittently. So I'm writing intermittent block. Longer, longer PR intervals. And you skip an R wave. I mean, the R wave is that spike that's very noticeable. So when it's not there, it's very noticeable. The third degree of heart block is complete block. The signal ain't getting down at all. So when the signal doesn't get down at all, you have a complete disassociation between uh, the atria and the ventricles. They're just beating on their own time. Each are on their own time. They're completely out of sync. So the atria contract on their own. The ventricles contract on their own, independent of the atria. That's what I'm writing. So what you're going to see is random P's and just random R. That's, that's kind of what it says there. P, R, P, R. So for the atrium, you get random P's on the ECG. And then on the ventricle, you get random R's. They appear random to each other because they're not related to each other. They're just going on their own. They're just beating on the, now the third degree heart block is the most serious one. The ventricles have pacemaker cells, but they're not very reliable. They're very slow to beat. It's actually the Purkinje fibers, as we'll see. Anyway, be able to know the difference between the three kinds of heart block. Now, the signal spreads down from atria to ventricles. It's going to do so down the septum. So um, the next structure we want to know is called the bundle of hiss. So on the figure that's colored in here, the atria where depolarized in yellow, red means repolarized. So you have depolarized, repolarized, red is repolarized. But notice the signal spreading down from 
um, the AB node through the singular structure called the bundle of his. It's right there. Let me color it in on the picture. Bundle of his. But he's green. Right there. This is the this is why you observe a conduction delay at the AV node. Because you have a, all this traffic converging to a single bundle. And it kind of slows up the signal. single bundle is responsible for conducting the signal down to the ventricles. It is responsible for signal conduction down the interventricular septum. down the septum, it branches into two. There's a left and there's a right bundle branch. Here's the left one. I'll call it that in orange. Down the septum. Wait, no, that's the right one, sorry. Right bundle branch in orange. in a purple color. So if you study models or whatever, look for these um, bundle branches in, in the inner ventricular septum. That's where they are. So, when you go down the bundle branches, the signal has spread to the apex of the heart, which is, you know, right here, that's the apex. The signal, or depolarization, spread to apex. Now, in terms of ECG, that presents as the Q wave. So look for the Q wave and you get that apex to the heart thing there. So we go the whole thing um, again. Here's P, PR segment, and the little down reflection that's usually hard to see. That's that's our cue. Okay. ST. So just what I drew in red. That represents Q wave. We got to the apex. So now the signal can start to spread up the sides of the heart wall. So it's very significant, and I 
I didn't notice this for years, so I'm calling it my appointment out to me. Why does the signal spread down the septum? Like, for example, let me go back a couple of slides. If the signal is spreading like so, and it does, how come it just doesn't, the yellow just doesn't spread down the whole thing? Why is it confined to just going down the septum? And there's an anatomical reason for that, and there's a beneficial reason for that. If you squeeze, if you started to polarizing from the top down through the whole ventricles, you, the top of the ventricles would start squeezing before the bottom, and that's inefficient. If you start squeezing from the bottom up, it's it's easier to squeeze out all the blood that's in it. Okay like squeezing a tube of toothpaste from the top. Well, what happens when you're squeezing the tube of toothpaste from the top? Don't you got all the stuff in the bottom of the tube of the toothpaste? I mean, what if your heart was like that every time it beat? You just kind of left half down there. That wouldn't be good. So it's good to squeeze the heart from the bottom up. And, uh, so by spreading down the septum, you can't squeeze the blood out, right? You're just depolarizing the middle septum. You can't squeeze anything by itself. It's got to spread up the sides of the wall to squeeze. That's the whole point of wringing blood out of the heart, squeezing the sides. And if you look at this picture here, the reason why you cannot spread, I call this the brass knuckle. What it is is it's the fibrous skeleton for the valves. Now it turns out fibrous connective tissue doesn't conduct signal well. That's why the signal can't spread straight down. Because these fibrous rings get in the way. They don't conduct signal. So this little hole, pay attention, that little hole is the opening for the bundle of hiss. So the entire signal must spread through that. Okay. Fibrous. Uh, rings or valves prevent or force conduction through a single bundle of hiss. That's why I wanted to show you that picture. I put a note next to that. I, I, I like to put that one on the quiz. Like a little hole when I say identify. A little hole. I was supposed to know that little hole. That's very important. It's for the one bundle of hiss. Okay, now the signal is going to spread up the side. And it's going to depolarize the big guys, you know, the ventricles. They're going to depolarize. And, well, um, before I get to that, on here, let's take an inventory of the cells that have pacemaker potential. So far, you know the SA node, that's your number one pacemaker. It can generate A to 100 APs per minute. Turns out the AV node, which I already mentioned, also has pacemaker potential. Calling it in here in blue. That has pacemaker potential. It's your number two pacemaker. It could generate 40 to 60 action potentials per minute. If something goes wrong with the SA node, the AV node can take over. If you have some kind of complete heart block, it turns out there are Purkinje fibers in the ventricles 
that have pacemaker potential? Who are your number three pacemakers? Twenty to forty amps per minute. They're not very reliable. They're kind of weak, but that might keep you alive until you can get the heart block uh, figured out. And, and they they live in the ventricles. So what happens is, from the bundle branches, the signals start to spread up the sides. And look for them on your heart. They spread to the uh, papillary muscles first so that the AV valve can be um, kept shut during systole. But the basic idea here is you're, you're spreading up the sides of the heart wall from bottom to top. And as you squeeze from bottom up, you're, you're squeezing all the blood out of the heart the stroke volume. So I call it the Purkinje covers, uh, Purkinje fibers red. They're basically modified muscle cells. But they can spread the conduction quite quickly. And when that happens, when the signal spreads up the sides of the wall for the Purkinje fibers, we see the, what's called the QRS complex. The QRS complex. complex represents ventricular depolarization when the signal is spread to the Purkinje fibers. They fire really fast, the Purkinje fibers. They make the ventricles contract hard. So basically, you know, just spread a signal fast, and you can tell that by the waveform. QRS is a sharp spike, it's not a lazy hill, like the P wave or the T wave. So I'm going to draw QRS just in red. QRS. QRS, and it represents ventricular depolarization. It's a sharp spike, and it shouldn't be more than 0.12 in terms of its duration, 0.12 seconds. And the QRS is going to cause systole, so we're still right before systole. So all the things that happen now are going to represent things that happen within the cardiac cycle. And that um, starts with the ST segment. So the ST segment, I forget about where I say green line, it's actually all green, but when I highlight it, it turns blue. That's the ST segment. The ST segment, now the heart's in full-on systole. Let me draw it, then define it. So I'll draw it up here. So P, Q, R. That segment is going to be right here, right before the T wave. So this is ST segment. This is peak systole for the ventricles. So peak systole, that's kind of like outflow. It's occurring during outflow. And so that's clinically 
important because if you're having a heart attack, this segment might show irregular, um, might be off. So the ST segment on the cardiac cycle is this entire peak systole right there. So if you have a detriment in cardiac performance, an ECG might show the ST segment. Maybe it's going to be below the line or above the line, and that could mean different things. ST segment depression below the line could uh, mean ischemia, which means a lack of blood flow. It could be just about to have a heart attack. Segment depression, ischemia, lack of blood flow, and there's different ways it can be depressed. It could be you can have it accompanied with T wave inversion. It could just be depressed the horizontal, whereas that's normal. The first frame is normal. So when below the line, depression is ischemia. So is that when doctors normally say that you had a pre heart attack? Yeah, okay. the, I think that term is applicable here. Okay. It, the heart muscle didn't die, but it, it was getting ischemic, and that could cause problems. Um, ST segment elevation above the line may indicate actual tissue dying, heart attack, or acute MI is what we call it. Ischemia leads to heart attack. Um, may present in different ways, but the ECG will show it above the line. Um, I got this from the tech who actually did it. I don't know you can Google this, but I always think it's the best to present from the guy who did it. Um, so look at lead two. This is a 12 lead. Lead two is right there. Okay. So what I did was I, for presentation purposes, I blew it up. And I'm pointing to the well do you see it? How it's like it's like completely running into the T wave. Okay, so that actually was confirmed heart attack. So this isn't Google, this is that was a real person. So elevation injury basically is what I'm saying there. Uh, so that's important. Alright, so um, that measures peak systole. You will also measure the entire QT interval, which represents the entire systole, not just the peak. So we'll do that. You measure that. QT interval. Measure. Measure all of that. That QT interval represents the entire systole. Remember, systole has two parts, right? So this is everything. One thing that we're going to try to get you to see is that the QT interval, these things change, these modify with the physiology. First, just to show you on the ECG um, with the cardiac cycle, it, it, it should represent all of the systole, all of the contraction and relaxation. And how we vary that in the lab is to have the subject exercise. So if you kind of like take the, um, de-hook the wires and have them do some vigorous exercise for a couple of minutes. You can read the procedures and how to do it. This is a good way to remind you. Whoever is going to be the subject, maybe determine that today in your groups for dissection. And then that person should come ready to exercise. Okay. Here, if resting heart rate is around here, elevated heart rate should be up here. Now look at the QT interval. Is it getting longer or shorter in time as heart rate goes up? Shorter. 
as heart rate goes up, there's an inverse relationship. It goes down. That, does that make sense? It should. It's like, okay, if I'm beating faster, shouldn't the whole thing be shorter? What this tells us is the ventricles are beating faster and harder during exercise, which is the case, right? Because don't, don't you have to pump more blood to meet the metabolic demands of exercise? Would this effect also be seen when you drink caffeine? Um, caffeine will elevate heart rate, yeah, by itself. Exercise should do it even more. Exercise is better than two cups of coffee. <laughs> What I usually say. Okay. All right. Well, we can actually measure ventricular repolarization. It's measured as a T wave. Okay. T wave. Some students usually ask, well, what about atrial repolarization? It will be happening during TRS. It's probably just masked by the TRS complex. We just can't see it. You can see T wave. Uh, so, the measuring T wave, it, it's the easy one to measure here. Right? And you just go basically that big hole. Usually the biggest deflection. So, this is when the heart muscle is just starting to relax. Okay. So it's kind of towards the end of isovolumetric ventricular contraction there. When the heart muscle starts to relax, the ventricles are in repolarization. So that's kind of what you see there during the T wave. A couple other things that we measure. In, in the lab, you'll measure what's called TP segment. That's simply from the end of one T to the beginning of the next P. Uh, basically, you're filling for the next cardiac cycle. Okay, so that represents ventricular filling. T P interval. Filling. I'll just say this is when you're filling. I'll say filling time. And if you're exercising, that, that time decreases because the heart's beating faster. Um, so anyways, if you're measuring it, i got to draw two ECGs here. So I'll draw one, P, Q, R, S, T. But then I'll draw it in red at the end of one T to the next P. P, Q, R, S. Okay, so what I drew in red, that's the interval between one cardiac cycle and the next. Pretty much that's when the heart is filling with blood. Now if your heart, you know, strong heart, the filling time is longer in the condition of rest. You know, endurance athletes or young people tend to have a slower heart rate, which means there's more filling time in between. And that's great, because that means with each cardiac cycle, you're pushing out enough blood to meet metabolic needs and you don't have to be this fast. On average, it's 75. For young people, it should be closer to 60 or 50. Okay. okay, R to R is the classic one used to estimate heart rate. Just from one rate, from one cardiac cycle to the next. You could use any component and just go from one to the next. But the R is the easiest to spot, and it's precise because it's usually a sharp spike to a point. Okay, so when you go R to R, that's heart rate. And when you measure R to R in the lab, the computer will automatically tell you what your heart rate is.
there. So this point here and here, R to R is heart rate. Let's say R to R, you measure it. Let's say you measure it as 0 0.8 seconds. Okay, so that is basically the, um, the rate between heart, between cardiac cycles. So what you could do to measure, uh, to manually calculate heart rate, Okay, one heartbeat takes 0.8 seconds. Sure put this right. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting this right. Hard to think about your feet when you're in front of a class. But anyways, I'm trying to get the right units, beats per minute. So what happens if you divide 60 divided by 0.8? The first one, do you see what I'm doing? Yes. Some yes, some no. I'm saying, why is R to R heart rate? Let's say you measure and it's 0.8. Okay, what does that mean? Well, the 0.8, that's, that's one heartbeat. That, that's what we're saying. It's the time between heartbeats. So the time between just two heartbeats is your heart rate. Okay. So if one beat um, from here to there, that's one, is 0.8. There's 60 seconds in a minute. I think you knew that. So then units cancel out. And our units are going to be beats per minute. That's my heart rate. So what's 60 divided by 0 0.8? 75. So if it's longer for a younger person, yeah, let, let's, say, let's say it's one second. You don't even have to do the math there. Then your heart rate is 60 beats per uh, second. So you'll see what it is. And the ECU components have the normal rates there. And you, you took the lab. Uh, let's take a break now, and uh, when we come back from break, maybe we'll start the next slide. And we'll go right in the lab. Come back at 10. 30.